got the Gehenna Gaming Podcast. Today, I'm your host, Ian, or Ravnos, as I am known on the internet. And today is a special episode of Gehenna Gaming Interviews. Today, I have two fantastic guests with me. Rick Hines, writer for Apotheosis Studios, as well as Geek and & Sundry and Gilding Light. And James Dorton, uh, voice actor and vocalist for Black Crown Initiate. Today, we're going to be talking about The Red Opera, a concept album turned rock, or more appropriately, metal opera, I guess turned Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition module. Um, we'll also be discussing the role music plays in tabletop gaming, uh, how these two gentlemen got their start on the Red Opera, and uh, some more interesting things. So I hope you enjoy the interview, and we're going to jump into it. Uh, first off, I do want to say congratulations on the successful launch of the Kickstarter campaign for the Red Opera. It's been, a, we're about uh, less than a week, actually exactly a weekend, aren't we? Um, yeah. It's pretty amazing, and you've, you're almost, uh, hopefully by the time we finish recording this, you will have passed uh, 60K. Yeah, almost 600% funded, um, but that's years of studying how Kickstarters work and a crap ton of no <laughs> sleep and working. Uh, nobody tells you, uh, you know, that first Kickstarter of just, it's like you should get like a badge just for going through your own first Kickstarter because, my God, the nerves and stress <laughs> are real. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, we we uh we've we've talked about doing a project that would require a Kickstarter and just the the mountain that we I know we'll have to climb to get that off the ground. I'm like, hmm, why am I our VP of strategy? <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it it looks awesome. I think um the way you structured the Kickstarter is really cool. The, the way you showcase the art throughout it is fantastic. Um, and I know you've opened a couple of the stretch goals, including the scenario you ran for us this past weekend, Killing Time. Yep, that was one uh, uh, I was very happy to see get uh, get unlocked, time-based warlocks, and also just unique ways to enter uh, the campaign and the setting. Yep. So, Rick, you're, um, you are one of the main writers for the Red Opera, but James, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit more about your involvement with the Red Opera? Well, um, I play the character of, of Dorian, the Accursed Lord. Um, I am a musician, first and foremost. Uh, gaming for me is sort of like something I'm kind of sort of recently been exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, I did a Dungeons and Dragons campaign last year with some buds of mine and uh, kind of showed what <laughs> just just how much of an amateur i am um but uh which is fine i'm okay with that but um yeah i i sort of came by the project sort of on accident um i can't remember exactly how i discovered dia morte which is like the the music end of a red opera but um i remember after hearing it for the first time i sent Drake Mephesta a message about it and just congratulated him on, on, on the work with it and told him I was a fan. Yeah. And he just sort of responded with like a, huh. Next thing you know, you're here. You <laughs> yeah. yeah, so here I am. And uh, fast forward. You know. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're, you're now on stage playing the Accursed King, you know? Like... Yeah, I'm like, was, I'm just like, oh. All of a sudden, I'm in this costume, and it weighs like 40, 46 pounds or something like that. I'm yep. all covered in sweat. Um, so, yeah, I feel like what I bring to the table is is mostly my my performance mm -hmm. resume, kind of with uh, with Black Hot Initiate and, and the rest of the, the stuff I've done, and as well as my my voice, my uh, you. You, you definitely my have speaking, my speaking, my speaking voice. Yeah. Which is very distinctive. <laughs> you, you, yeah. You walk around with like one of the most epic deep metal voices ever. <laughs> like just naturally it's like, all right, I, I need you to narrate a few audio books for me, by the way. So. Hey, you let me know. Very cool. I got you. I got you. Awesome. So, so um, yeah. Great. So, um, Rick, you have obviously are, um, more ingrained into the tabletop industry, uh, both in terms of your writing on games, but also uh, in terms of media uh, for the work you've done for Geek and Sundry, Gilding Light, and other places. Uh, how did you originally get into tabletop gaming? So I originally got into it um, because 
there was I was in chess club, right? Like you would do in high school. Like, As hey, you congratulations, your chess. I'm in I'm in freshman year in high school, and I joined chess club because I was on football team, and I was walking past, and I I was a skinny little kid on football, but I really liked it. But I found out that all of like drama club and all of the tech clubs had way cooler people that I wanted to hang out with and and go associate with. So I, I joined over there and we were at a chess tournament in like Bradley, Bourbonnet, Illinois, like out in the middle of nowhere. And there was somebody playing this game called Wraith the Oblivion. And <laughs> I had sat down uh, with them. It, I had a crush on the person who was running the game. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, hey, I totally want to play. And so thus, um, you know, my first gaming experience was over a crush and I played a game as a dead person by candlelight in the freaking high school uh, after a chess tournament. And uh, that, that was my first introduction to the game. Wraith is a that's that's an interesting first game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wraith is, I mean, Wraith I is heavy. Don't get me wrong. I, I, you know, played obviously Final Fantasy VII and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Final Fantasy VI, three, and a bunch of other uh, small, uh, like muds, like strange, yep. uh, strange mud, like multiple user online dungeons and and stuff like that. But actually, role playing, my first foray was into Wraith the Oblivion. Damn, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I, I always enjoy talking to people about like seeing the juxtaposition between people whose first game was Dungeons and Dragons or something World of Darkness related or um, I think I've only met one person whose first game was Shadowrun and they were like, yeah, I'm surprised I still game. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, bathtubs and D6s are a thing. Yeah. Uh, I, don't get me wrong. I, I love Shadowrun. I, 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 As do I. I. Did, uh, I, I did a bunch of stuff with uh, the, like the Johnson missions and, yeah. and things like that. But uh, one fun trick I've picked up after interviewing just tons of uh, game master storytellers, whatever, mm -hmm. the term that somebody calls the dungeon master or the game master or the storyteller is arguably the first sign of what they came in from, from a background, right? Mm. If you came in from D and D you're obviously, you know, a DM dungeon yep. master, uh, you know, game master comes from a lot of other, other systems, but you know, you know, riffs, GURPS, uh, things like that. And storyteller arguably hit the more narrative systems like white wolf and yep. uh, that line from, from within. So it's funny is that even in this, even though it's a fifth edition campaign module, I basically almost always refer to it as a storyteller because that's where, where I from. had grown up through Nice. That's interesting. Yeah. I think I had eventually adopted using GM instead of, I started with D&D &D myself, uh, but as opposed to Storyteller or DM, because GM just felt more like system agnostic uh, to me, which is why I was like, well, I don't want to like pigeonhole certain roles. But Sounds it, like general manager. Yeah, <laughs> that too. Yeah, right. It, uh, <laughs> but it, 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 yeah, you toss it around. Oh, I got my ST for my, uh, you know, for, for my LARP, and, and we're going to run the, uh, you know, su such and such uh, 3.5 or, you know, the second edition, you know, rulebook. It sounds like you're talking like IT tech talk after oh, a yeah. while. Um, There's so many know. acronyms in gaming that it could very easily slide right into being about IT. <laughs> Um, so uh, Wraith being your first game and obviously, uh, the Red Opera is a Dungeons and Dragons module. What is your favorite game system? Dread. Hands down good, Dread. Good, that's a good I, answer. yeah, I will, I mean, don't get me wrong. I will run when I sit down and start storytelling games, I'll mm -hmm. pick which game I want to run or which system we're using based on the story I want to tell. So when one of my homebrew games, I had this whole thing where people were gonna play in uh, Ravnica, um, mm -hmm. but I wasn't necessarily sure that the, uh, the, the 5e Guildmasters of Ravnica was the system setting that I wanted to use. Uh, so I actually ran Ravnica via like a Powered by the Apocalypse engine because I wanted to run it like in the wastelands and things like that. And, but I've also done um, I will mix and match game systems like nobody's mm -hmm. business. I will study what every game system is doing well, and then I'll grab and pull it. But Dread is a universal mechanic of mine because I can throw a Jenga tower down in the middle of any table. And when you have this Jenga tower down and players are there in a very tense scenario and it's a horror, uh, horror bit, and I describe like the lupines attacking you and you know, you're know you running through the trains and whatnot, as they start pulling from the Jenga tower, that thing starts getting closer and closer to falling. Um, everybody shuts up at the table 
you know, it gets real quiet, the cell yep. phones are silent, the food is there, and it's that tactile immersion that gives people there. And you can throw dread in Vampire, uh, you can throw it in, in Dungeons and Dragons. I've thrown the Jenga Tower into almost everything is like an environmental time bomb that the players will have to work around whether I'm pulling from the pieces or the, uh, the, the players are. So time and time again, I come back to, I like storytelling for dread. Also, because you can take anybody, even if they're not a brand new, or even if they're not an experienced vet gamer, mm -hmm. everybody knows how to use a Jenga tower. And if they don't, they pick it up really, really fast. I like dread uh, primarily because there's no math <laughs> and I'm really bad at math. <laughs> Which is nice, but uh, you know that Dread is a fantastic game, um, and uh, we were talking before about Ten Candles as well. That's one of my favorites. That's one of my favorites to play in. Yeah, uh, is 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 Ten Candles. Absolutely. Yeah, I sh I will I will have to run Ten Candles for you. I actually ran it digitally recently, and it's so an interesting for, experience online. For for those who don't know, Ten Candles is this uh, amazing RPG where you use you. you at the start of the game, you make a recording for your character yep. and you all go around the table in the dark doing this recording about like your, uh, like a message of what you think is going to happen and what are you afraid of? And then you light the candles and then every hour in game or every scene in game or when somebody dies, you snuff out a candle yep. and you move on to the next scene until eventually there's only one person left. And when the last candle light goes out, in darkness you replay the recording that you started at the beginning of the game and it is chillingly absolutely terrifyingly haunting and it is beautiful and i love it and i try to incorporate those experimental elements into just about anything that i write uh game wise or run awesome you gotta get me in on the game sometime man oh yeah it, it will happen that'd be good that'd be if, you, nice. if, you, if you can do if you can deal with like my lack of experience <laughs> that is. Well, that's the good thing I about you you, like dread and you know how candles. to use a lighter and fire. Yeah. Yeah. You know how to use a lighter and a fire and a Jenga tower. We're good to go. I can tell you a freaking story, and you already like just imagine you in a darkened room with like five other people, and your voice just like echoing across <laughs> about what is you are terrified would be yes. I have found that whenever I do play these games, I, I feel like I can bring something, and I, I tend to add. I tend to add to the experience somehow. I always find a way, in a good way, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, Every, every everybody yeah. adds to the experience at a tabletop game. That's what makes it so fun, right? And okay. that's what you want. Uh, the game is never just written by the writers or the storyteller who happens to be running that game. It's written collaboratively by the players at the table who are running it through the choices that they make. So, you know, that's why it's an awesome experience because it's supposed to be this collaborative vehicle for our imaginations. I got it. Yeah, I got to get back. We should, yeah, we should schedule something, man. I'm in for it. Awesome. Trust me, I'm pretty sure I'm going to grab you in in costume on a stream and be like, all right, <laughs> you you are playing the Accursed King uh, in character. Here's your, here's your level 20 character sheet. Let's go. <laughs> And you're gonna look at this thing like, what the hell is this? Nah, that's, the, that's a that's a great idea. That's we, a great uh, idea. We we did say we wanted to do a follow up to uh, Killing Time. Yeah. Um, there so, you go. So, past that, um, James, you are also a voice actor. Um, in addition to your work in music, and you've lent your talents to uh, games like Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Um, and you were also a member of the Choir of Doom for Doom Eternal. Do you find that there's a lot of crossover between music and your voice acting? Um, or has that stayed kind of separate for you? Well, um, I think inevitably my, my, my experience with, with music has given exposure to, to my voice. Um, and has let me opportunities, uh, like with, with the doom choir, mm -hmm. that was something that, um, was through my notoriety in, in black crown. Right. Um, the work I did for elder scrolls, that was before that was long before all that. I was still, <laughs> <laughs> I was still involved with, uh, like a, I had a full-time job at a bank and, yep. um, I was doing bands, but it was kind of like a part-time local, local band thing. And so 
um, you know, I think it's, I think it's good to have those things inter intertwine and sort of feed off each other. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm not, I'm not one to try to force things to be too separated because then I think you miss out on, on opportunities. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, and then obviously you connected with Yamorte um, about the Red Opera because of the music, but do you feel like your experience in voice acting has influenced your work um, playing Dorian? Yeah, well, my voice acting has influenced my my vocals in general, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I have definitely become a guy who who does vocals very intentionally, and I, I like to enunciate very clearly um, and think about what I'm doing before I do it. So um, I, I approach my vocals a, a lot, and much in the same way that I approach voiceover. Um, I think to, to some end, I'm not really sure what my voiceover will, like my speaking voice will probably do something for, for Diamorte. And with Diamorte too, I'm not just gonna be doing screaming vocals. I'm mm -hmm. gonna be doing screaming vocals and also um, operatic vocals too. So, uh, which is not something I've done before in a band setting. I, I've done choir and yeah. chorale stuff in the past, and but this is the first time that I'll be under like a spotlight, you know, <laughs> <laughs> with 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 uh, with my with my naked, clean voice. So, um, no pressure. Nope, not anything, none at all. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's 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 fine. I um. Yeah, so I'm excited to see what what kind of op what opportunities kind of grow out of that. Awesome, that'll be that'll be cool. We'll definitely keep an eye on it, and uh, maybe we'll bring you back on once you've expanded uh, both that experience and uh, your tabletop uh, experience, and have another conversation. Yeah, about maybe it. I'll know what I'm talking about. By then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I, talking I, about by then. I also can't wait to see like the live performance <laughs> when it when it when it actually goes on. Mm. Right. I mean, you know, we all know 2020 is a year of uh, yeah, the dumpster fire on top of the dumpster fire in yes. the landfill at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. But originally, uh, we were going to be having the live performances of the Red Opera stage show happening at Gen Con this year. Um, but, uh, you know, on account of 2020 mm -hmm. that will have to be postponed until till later on but the costumes that have been coming in and the stuff that they've they've gotten prepped in the set sets and stage shows i can't freaking wait myself that, that's super exciting and you'll definitely have to let us know i, I will need to be there <laughs> yeah man hopefully 2021 doesn't make 2020 look like child's play yeah i guess we'll see we will we'll see. see, but you know, that, that, that's the, that's the intention, you know, to definitely grow the performance aspect of it. I think 2020 was, was good in the sense that it gave us an opportunity to, you know, really grow the dimension of the red opera and bring this whole other side of it to the table and really grow it exponentially. Um, yeah, and I think that, we'll, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it'll, yeah. it'll kind of serve as like a nice foundation slash good, fertile ground for a springboard into the future with this stuff you know what i mean because originally it was the other way around uh the uh, the tour and the band was going to be going doing the live stage show and then this the rpg part was going to come out you know much 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 later but right. we Which realistically would have been the harder way to do it <laughs> yeah it, it's you know? I, I, I I think I think in this this case it was actually a blessing that we we're able to create. Uh, Apotheosis was able to do a bunch of the amazing art and put together a lot of the stuff to help bring it and add more more life to it. This way oh, yeah. around, so I view it. I view it this way. I think like, um, like tabletop gaming and RPGs, it, it's 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 way bigger than heavy metal is. You know, it's a it's a bigger industry than than metal music is. Like the music industry is, it's shot through pretty pretty terribly you know it already was before the age of COVID-19 um and now I think there's there's like things working against it I do I do also think you know while I say that it's it's not it, it's becoming more popular than it, than it ever was especially in the United States 
Absolutely. A lot has changed, you know, and I've witnessed it change firsthand through my own experience. But, you know, gaming is a huge, huge industry. It's huge, you know, and I think that it was good that we had that kind of shift in approach. Um, and I think it's, it's really, it, like, I, I'm, in, I'm impressed by the other guys and how just intelligent and pro they are in the creation of this thing because it's to me you know from the from a musician standpoint this is this is altogether unique and i think it's um it, it's cool to see people rolling with challenges that are coming their way and still finding a way to make it thrive you know yeah absolutely it, it's this has been an interesting year to be involved in the tabletop industry in general, but just watching the explosion of popularity of it and the new ideas coming out of it because of being so required to be playing remotely and digitally. It's been very cool to witness firsthand. Um, Last question before we jump into really t talking about the Red Opera, and this is kind of about the Red Opera anyway, but uh, Rick, uh, you also are a writer and you have a book series uh, called The Seventh Age. Yep. And beyond that, which is, a, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of like a uh, alternate take on modern times. Yeah, the the whole like, it's sarcastic urban fantasy about yeah. the end of the world. Thank the you. the whole the whole yeah. joke of the, the Seventh Age series is that it's what happens today. It's like the Illuminati, the Masons, mm -hmm. and all these other secret studies. They had magic forever. And what happens in Chicago when a group of anarchists level the playing field by deciding to give that shit to everybody in the world? Yeah. And you know nothing could possibly go wrong when everybody can summon up a demon, kill it, and eat its heart in ah. exchange for supernatural powers, right? Yeah, that'll be so it. It's all, it's all about like massive power balance shifts when something that was ruled by a very small people all of a sudden gets thrust out to, to everybody and how the world changes. So it's a post-apocalyptic novel series. I actually got a publisher for it. Uh, the Prince of Cats Publishing uh, is re-releasing the first book and my sequel will be out early next year on that one. Awesome. Well, I'd, love, I'd love to read this. Yeah. It's, it's conceptually very cool. That I'm glad that you just like were like, nope, let me describe that for you. Because I was like, how do I read what's the right? Because <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it yeah, blends a, a lot of cool lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so beyond that, you, you've obviously, we talked about Wraith earlier, you've worked across a variety of genres in tabletop. How does that, that breadth of experience, how has that influenced your work on the Red Opera? I, I picked up on a little bit of the... Um, uh, and I want to let you talk about it, but the Red Opera has the letter home, um, and that is very reminiscent of that rec recording at the beginning of a Ten Candles game, uh, for instance. So I'm kind of curious yep. to see how your different um, experiences in the industry has influenced this module. So one of the things, uh, and my big kind of, uh, I, after writing the novel, the next thing I did was GM Tips with Geek and Sundry, yep. where I worked with Satine Phoenix and I took over, like Matt Mercer started it, Satine Phoenix took it over and then I, I carried it on from there. Uh, but I was working with Satine Phoenix for the duration of the video show and then I was writing the articles and then after that it was just editorial. But in this process, it was something that we had started to do to interview and talk to other storytellers and listen to mm -hmm. you know different ways to run a game and hear all these experts that had been in the industry for a really long time what worked what didn't work different types of storytelling I mean, it's why i run a whole panel called like how to not suck at storytelling where we talk about our worst freaking failures and so when i wrote the red opera i actually sat down and tried to write it as what would i use in a book what is the coalescence of all these other storyteller tips and tools and things that we need to actually run a full story so that the players can have maximum player agency to have actual impact in the world to both challenge high tier play and low tier play to allow the book to be plugged in any setting because at this point i was coming i'd interviewed i had written over 200 articles and about different aspects of it. I'd run every type of game from 600 person LARPs to small games from, you know, just a handful of, of players. I've done the experimental storytelling. I've done the, you know, uh, the org play I've done, you know, I've been doing, I've been do, doing the ST stuff for about 18 years across a 
ton of different game systems. So I've dabbled into a lot of different places and I've extensively run and even gotten to that point before where you would get like way too into your own, your own game and had to be mm-hmm. pulled back out. But the, in, the reason all of that stuff kind of coalesced is I found myself writing what I wanted to actually have in a book that I hadn't been able to find yet. And that was kind of this merging of all these different storytelling styles. When we get to the letter home, we have this thing in the Red Opera that is meant to get your players truly hooked into the game. And at the start of the game, every player sits on down and writes a letter to their loved ones or their past ones or home village or a king that they maybe care about. And this works whether or not they're level 20 characters, level 15, level four, you know, whatever. Every character should have some connection to the world. If they don't, it builds that connection. If they've already been playing up a bunch of levels, it reminds them of a connection they may have forgotten. And throughout the Red Opera, should that character die? Well, there are certain effects that happen with that letter home based on which endings you pick, based on where you are in the storyline. But suffice it to say, that letter gets burned and everybody who ever knew your character forgets that character ever existed because we are an opera and we need that tragic end oh yeah which i i also we talked about this um when we played killing time that that change to the way death works in D D is like a breath of fresh air which is part of the pun <laughs> but uh because death is kind of a joke in dungeons and dragons is that's the opening monologue from Majin in the Red Opera. He's like, I am tired. Like, even, like, even in the, the Kickstarter trailer, which mm-hmm. is beautifully done by David Granjo from Apotheosis. Like, that is my favorite part of this video so far. <laughs> but uh, he, um, even in that video, when I'm doing the, the voiceover, we talk about how, like, druids have even gotten into the pesky game of reincarnation, uh, you know. And obviously, there's a major plot element around somebody trying to right. find a way to get around that so Fantastic. but that's that's how all that has influenced nice so obviously the red opera was born out of concept album by diamorte yep. um from your standpoint as a writer what has been the importance to you of the music behind the red opera immersion a hundred percent immersion. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it, when it comes down to it, uh, Drake Mephesto, when I pitched this idea of writing this thing to him, I said, listen, you have an, uh, you have a loose idea of a story framework, right? Lyrical sheets and the overall conceptual base of the base album, as it was originally conceived, had a lot of room for filling in gaps and connecting story weaves. And I said, listen, man, all I needed to do is understand that the ending is going to be determined by players because players in a tabletop game have player agency. And so I need multiple branching storylines and you just gotta let me cut loose. So when I wrote it, we just, I just listened to the album every day while I was was writing. And that helps me get the the scenes, the settings, the feel of this. And that's why the Shadelands isn't this dark, gloomy place because when in the music and James, you can speak more to, to this, but there are some very, very pretty and lighthearted uh, orchestral bits or, or or parts in the background of the music. So that's why the Shadelands is a really colorful place, vibrant, filled with life, a metropolitan city. You know, it's not just, you know, bleak, depressing, you know, there, because it's got this, I don't know how to describe it. It's got just this, this wonderful melody that kind of goes through a lot of the the song tracks in the background, even when they rise to those epic beats and plot points. Now, obviously each act is tied and titled based off of it. So Mm -hmm. I took each act of the Red Opera and I made sure that we hit certain beats uh, based on on the song tracks. And we went to different parts of the Shadelands based off the, the, the titles. I, it's it's fascinating to me as kind of a amateur writer. Um, I do more game running than writing, obviously. Uh, I've always been a big, 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 big fan of music across everything I do. Um, and just uh, hearing that is how it came to life to you is really cool uh, because that's also how I picture music. Um, and I can appreciate that personally. Um, 
I do want to flip the question a little bit now, James, mm -hmm. from your standpoint, um, the music influencing the story, um, but also how has um, working with Rick influenced the music itself? So far, I guess we will see how that manifests. I think mm -hmm. the, the new stuff is sort of being generated now. Mm -hmm. um, and I can only foresee that this growing out of the original opera has just created a lot of, um, a, a lot of, of context, mm -hmm. a lot of just sheer content yeah. and just a volume of, of that, I think will, it will just kind of help carry the music into the continuation of the story. Yep. Um, so we're, we, we only have one song under the belt and, and we haven't written the actual story part to it yet. So I think that's sort of to be seen. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That's um, what that's of the stuff that hasn't come out yet. That's the next stuff, James. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's, 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 for those that's, that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like, it may or may not be, you know, that. But I, I think that like, yeah, that's, that's, that's to be seen. We're sort of, we're sort of hashing out now how we're going to approach the, uh, the creation of the next part. Awesome. So. It'd be very exciting. It'd be interesting to see, um, because Rick, you and I have spoken briefly previously about kind of taking on this lore master mantle for the yep. band. Um, it'd be interesting because now they're uh, now now the the way it is like when we stitched all the lore together. Mm -hmm. um, originally, there's an there's an interesting thing, James. You you know about this too. When you know Drake would go around and they would put on the the early Red Opera shows, a bunch of people would would fly in and it was an ensemble cast and sometimes people couldn't make it. And so Drake on the fly was just penning in like, okay, you're playing this character Cordelia, here you go. Or you're playing this person, you know, here you go just to give them a spot on stage. But because of that, the from a few stage shows, the land, the 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 lore had become pretty patchwork. With this, the, the Red Opera re revision, the entire storyline has been cohesive. And even the, the the stage show is now gone through of like what's happening on stage, what's gonna be, you know, what is the story that we're telling, which yep. is different than the campaign because there's, the campaign is the last days of the warlock. The stage show is actually the tragedy of Yonkov. And um, so like that's some of the, the ways that the writing, now that there is this concrete like sort of series Bible of these are who the characters are and this is what's going on. Now it's it's very easy to write around that framework of here's what's happening. That's really interesting. Um, I just just the, the concept in general of a tabletop game influencing a rock opera and vice versa is I think incredibly unique. So it will be really cool to see mm -hmm. where the next stage of this goes. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. So James, you mentioned earlier in our introduction how you got involved, but Rick, how did you get involved with the Red Opera and Diamorte? Oh God. All right. So this is the story. This is the question on this thing that when a certain band member hears this, he's gonna be like, You better not, Rick, because I know his true name. But there is one band member, and it is Drake. And I will not speak his true name here, for I will summon him from the abyss. Uh -oh. uh, but uh, <laughs> I only recently uh, learned his true name, by the way. Only recently. Uh, he so, keeps him to refs. Uh, the I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for this, but you know what? He's at this point, he's got to come out of the gaming closet. Drake is a giant geek, um, and we met at a live-action Vampire the Mask role-playing game, or Vampire yeah. the Mask great role-playing game. And him and I, I played a character uh, named Damien Bryce. He played a character named Dorian uh, Lipola. Uh -huh. um, and uh, he, him and I had such an amazing rivalry where we were just absolute enemies within the game for like six months. And our friendship hit it off. But this, the rivalry between the characters was epic. And it had a horribly tragic ending for him because Tremere win. Uh, that's yeah, what happens yes. when Gangrel go up against the Tremere Ooh. Prince of the city. Ooh. Um, Ooh. Yeah, those are my two favorite clans, yeah. sir. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Well, I mean, you know, I'm the Tremere Prince. He's this Gangrel anarchist trying to cause trouble in my city and it didn't end well yeah, for him. That's eventually. gonna be one-sided. You know, he, he, <laughs> 
even though he survived Night of the Red Heart like twice, and I was really surprised by that. But he was very interested, and we were definitely much more of like uh, the acting type and really getting into like the moments and the mm-hmm. scenes and the beats. And what's really funny is that Drake would come and he would play piano. He was just getting into his composing, and this was years ago. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that after that game, Drake had kind of stopped playing some LARPs and he really was inspired to go create something. And he actually went off and then started composing the original album. And just like six months ago, he was like, yeah, dude, it was because of that game when I was playing the freaking pianos and doing this stuff. And I started going off to, to do these things. And so I've known Drake uh, for, I think over 10, 12 years now. Mm-hmm. Now we've come in and out of each other's lives at, at various points. Like there are times where we just wouldn't see each other for two years. Cause he would be off going performing or doing right. You know, his, and then I was off doing my thing. But at one point, I think, in in this regard, we we met back up together, and we were in our kitchen, and they were talking about as a, a metal industry and metal music how to get out and be more noticed, right? I mean, he they had the entire symphony, they had all this composition, they had these epic stage shows, but they didn't know how to get out. And I was just drinking a glass of mead, and I was like, I should make a tabletop campaign book. They got quiet. <laughs> looked at me and then i knew i was writing a campaign book <laughs> yep you did it to yourself really yep you're like ah crap <laughs> <laughs> it started oh, it, no. it was originally only going to be this like twenty thousand word little like splat book paper black thing um but when i started writing and listening to the music mm-hmm. i was like yeah i'm gonna write a twenty thousand word little splat book you can sell it at a band merch at a concert whatever it's unique you can do this thing and then i was listening to the music again and again and again on a repeat and i was writing and i was writing and writing and then i got pat edwards involved and pat edwards started listening to it and joe asmahani started and as more people got added in on the writing team we just kept going bigger and bigger and it was just fucking epic like it just was oh, yeah. and, and uh so that's how that like music and immersion like got there but how i got into it drake and i played rock paper scissors back in the day essentially yeah that's that's the most interesting and yet very very basic <laughs> origin story <laughs> so um based on that then uh i think that obviously the red opera has grown well beyond what you originally thought of it, um, which I think is cool because more, especially in 2020, more unusual groups, I should say, mostly bands, are getting into tabletop. Uh, Black Dahlia Murder put out a splat book. Um, I think I've just recently found out the Dead Milkmen are putting out a D&D adventure, and I was like, okay, that's a thing. Um, And then there's a film uh, that got delayed because of COVID, uh, called The Green Knight, which uh, is by A24, and they released a loosely D&D-based, but it, it kind of has its own thing, I think, uh, RPG supplement that kind of is a marketing promotional thing for the movie, well, which so, is cool. You know what I mean? And, and, and that kind of, like, crossing of media that uh, mm-hmm. I believe the term that uh, I think your marketing director tossed out, the, the transmedia like, <laughs> concept yeah. of, of this, which is pretty awesome. But I did want to, like, I do want to, like, make thing, uh, make it very clear what separates or what I really try to do with the Red Opera is it is its own unique tale. Like, you're not playing somebody else's, uh, you know, you're not, like, in another IP. You right. take this story and you drop it into your own world. Mm-hmm. Because this is that all that, like, hey, years of player agency and storytelling, you know, stuff. I was like, what the hell could I use to run if I was a storyteller? Absolutely. Um, so in flesh, further fleshing out the Red Opera and what you've done there, uh, other than the fact that they are the best class in D&D, why focus on Warlocks? Ah, uh, yes, because in the <laughs> lyrics, they reference them as hidden ones, mm. right? And uh, there was a character, Majin the Betrayer, he doesn't exist in the uh, original lyrics. He's only known as the Betrayer, and he's not like a person. He's kind of just like this 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 almost like the shade lands itself okay and uh when they the original like the original album talked about these two people that were engaged in an arms race with each other using supernatural means and i was like all right first off 
I went and I looked, there was no other major warlock content for fifth edition. I mean, warlocks were added on as like a secondary class. Uh, they are a really awesome class that very much doesn't get the, the light of day. There's no great cities run by warlocks. There's no, there's, there's paladins, there's wizards, there's stuff for all the main classes, but warlocks don't have any major supplemental material other than an add-on at the back of books yep. or like are in a split joint book venture, much less a campaign featuring them. And so that is why warlocks, but also because the hidden ones, the idea that you can make a deal or cut an arrangement with a devil is something that you can open up to everybody else in the party, even temporarily. And it's a great way to have tragic operatic storylines and reference even and play true to the original uh, lyrical sheets where they talk about how they've cut deals with hidden ones. Mm -hmm. Well, the hidden ones are just patrons. Awesome. I, it, I obviously, by the way, I asked the question, warlocks are my favorite class, so I, I appreciate that a lot. But I think it's also really cool that you are adding more material for a class that's been historically underserved without it being more of the same. Um, it's not just, here's alternate, you know, here's more star-packed stuff that you can do with, um, that's a fourth, fourth edition term because I've played more fourth edition than fifth. Uh, but then, you know, here's just more stuff for the fiends and here's more here, stuff here's, for here, the great old ones. It's different and that's really cool. Yeah. Here's a, here is a storyline for you guys, but the world that you're featured in and also, so everybody else in the party can join in rather mm -hmm. than just that one, that one aspect. Yeah. Um, so we covered, I had a couple other questions here drafted that we covered in some of the previous ones, but I, you were, made me think of something earlier. Obviously, the story of um, Yonkath and the Red Opera is told in the Amorte's album, but what about the Shadelands as a whole, and where, where did that concept come from? If not, Oh, that's... that's all that, from that's there. pat edwards that that's pat edwards <laughs> and i like yeah. uh we that that's where drake really gave us this like hey you have creative control to mm -hmm. just cut loose and, and build this out even the even the name the city yankoth was created by pat edwards who's a who's, who's the other co-author mm -hmm. co-author of this uh and it was you know yonder and Cathrek. those names and all of the stuff about the city uh, the setting, the shade lands where it's set, the veil between worlds running things, the Black River, the Well of Souls, all of that stuff was created because, you know, in the lyrics, you're you're really just talking about, you know, the characters who are on stage yep. and these these song vocals. It's like a lot That's of dialogue. Why... It's a lot of dialogue, right? Like yeah. yeah. It's very very it alludes to what's happening without being very specific with with this type of stuff. Yeah. I feel. Yeah. But, so in the book, we have like the quotes of a lot of the quotes you see are dialogue quotes from the lyrics. Right. And, but I, we had to then as writers fill in the gaps and create mm -hmm. the. So you did a lot of world building for this as opposed to needing to do scenario writing. Um, you kind of had some of that structure there, it sounds like, but you had to then create all the world around it to give players you know, more choice. Yep. No, that's. Yeah, we had a. That's the fun part <laughs> to me. Uh, that's why I said, like, the we you know asked how the music influenced the writing. It was mm -hmm. immersion. We yep. just listened to the music and then built a world and storyline based off it. Cool. Um, I think for both of you, then, what is your favorite part of the Red Opera? Like, what is your favorite aspect of it that you've either, um, Rick, you've gotten to write or maybe that was part of the original concept album? And then, James, for you, what what's your favorite part of the show? Well, uh, for me, um, like my, my favorite part sort of selfishly has been kind of my connection to the character of Dorian. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I like, I don't really have like a ton of acting experience mm -hmm. or any of that kind of thing outside of voice acting. So, but it is something I'm kind of like trying out a little bit, you know, um, so I'm, I'm kind of taking that approach with this character, knowing that at some point needing to be able to bring this thing to life and being in a costume and interacting with other people and swinging swords around, that there's going to be some degree of, of acting with this thing. So one, the fact that it's challenging me in that way 
is 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 pretty hugely inspiring mm-hmm. to me but also kind of like i have some kind of i don't know like i've already had this very deep personal connection to the character itself like there's some kind of like it's sort of like when you meet somebody and you know yes that you get it <laughs> like you're like i get you yeah. you know like you just know you're going to get this person it's sort of like that um and you know that that will unfold over the breadth of your experience with that person. That's how I feel about Dorian and this character. It's like, I, I feel like it's sort of going to develop who I am as a person outside of just the character itself. So that I think like that for me, like whenever, whenever I'm involved in something artistically, I always have this like, <laughs> I always figure out this way to make it seem very... I don't know, dramatic, but really it's because I think that it's important to me that when I'm doing any kind of artistic anything that I have to sort of well some kind of significance to it for me in order, one, for it to be worth my time, but two, for it to be the best thing that it can because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be terribly replaceable, you know, <laughs> for one, you know, but also just because of it's, it's, it's just important for me to have something I be a part of, be the best thing that it, that it can and sort of give a sort of wow factor for people. So that that's, mm-hmm. this for me will be that that's, that's something for sure. Um, you know, aside from that, like the interaction between the characters, I think the whole thing is just very, very beautiful you know like the music itself is very beautiful um and this i I always love a tragic (laughs) opera kind of thing um so yeah you know i I, i'm I'm just i'm I'm very like glowing about this whole thing right now (laughs) awesome I'm, i'm very very happy to be part of it very cool it's exciting and rick Uh, Favorite part of the Shade Lens. All right, let's see here. Spoiler (laughs) and not spoiler. Um, All right. One thing that we had a lot of fun with in writing was the rewriting of the character Fate. Mm -hmm. So there's the major main characters of of the opera, like the, there's, you know, Lacroix, the, the, you know, night captain who's on the side, who's on one side. You have, you know, obviously Dorian on the other side, the accursed king, and Fate was arguably trapped in the middle. And you know, it opens up with, you know, oh, at one point, you know, fate was, you know, in a relationship and and with with Dorian and they built Jan Koth uh, together. And then, you know, currently the night captain is now, you know, pining after her. And it opens up fate's bio with she is in love with neither of them. <laughs> and she is like, nope, I am the governess of this city. You know, these two people are nuts. Like I am my own person. And we had uh, Courtney Penny, who was one of the story writers. She did a really great job helping rewrite Fate's character arc yes. to bring it, uh, you know, into this like wonderful line of, because she's the one who goes with the party all the way through mm-hmm. all of the adventures. And so Fate's thorough for a story where it starts off as her own and then kind of like works with the party. And then, you know, the party, you know, gets to be involved. And then ultimately, eventually at some point, the party is now the ones making the choices. And, you know, they get to pick what happens to the end of the Shadelands, which side do they ultimately go to and that so it's it's fate's thread taking players all the way through to the point where the players make the choice of which faction you guys going to support or are you going to pick your own and that's my i think favorite part of it but i also just love in the fate's bio where it's like fate is not in love with either of these people like this is not (laughs) you know romeo juliet you know or like that tragic love story it's just nope this is where we're at (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome. Um, Great. Yeah. You're career oriented. Well, I mean, look at it this way. If uh, <laughs> Dorian's spending all of his times courting patrons in his high tower, like you're going to be doing and, you know, trying to, you know, dabble with gods. What about all the other people who actually live in the city? Who's going to Brit the coins? Who's going to actually marshal the guard? Who's going to do all the stuff? Who's going to give the permits for the houses? Like, you know, who's going to make sure that people are fed? You know what? You know who's got the real power? Think about this. this. Fate. Fate's got the power. 
Mm, I didn't think about that. Oops. (laughs) Nice. Um, so James, this is kind of your first, uh, you know, tabletop RPG project that you're working adjacent to. Um, do you think there's other projects or, you know, is this going to kick off more work in that space for you? Do you think? I hope so, man. You know, I feel like I've always been kind of peripheral to this stuff and I, I still don't count myself as someone who is, is an expert, but you know, I've always like kind of been kind of like a, you know, half ass gamer, so to speak, you know, like I've, I've, like I love games. It's just one of those things where I haven't had just a, I, I'm not very good at budgeting my time. So, <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know. I'm like a type of person. I don't know how to relax. I don't really know how to enjoy myself. Um, That's a mood. So <laughs> not, I mean, you know, like I, I get there, but it's, it's like a bit of a, it's, it's a thing. So, you know, I would love it to, we will see. I don't know how often uh, RPGs really or need of a voice guy, but wherever I can find that avenue, I will. But I, I do, I do have some learning to do, and awesome. I need some more hands, hands-on experience. But you know, like I've, I've not once, you know, ever been bored or disliked it at all. I, I just, I, I love, it. I love it a lot, actually. So I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Very cool. Very cool. So. I do want to um, kind of go into some rapid fire questions here for a bit, but I do want to give you a chance to talk about some cool projects as well. Um, James, I know that Black Crown Initiate had an album come out this year. Is there any other uh, exciting stuff you're working on, you know, outside of the Red Opera coming up soon people can look forward to? Yeah. Uh, so I am in another band called Replicire. Sire. Um, Rebel Sire is, it's, it's a lot different than any other project I've really done in the past. Um, they're a band that's based out of Boston and it's kind of more like a Dillinger escape plan ish. Yes. Type of <laughs> I'm listening band. It's really wild <laughs> and it's going to test me very much. Awesome. So right now I'm kind of in the throes of finishing up writing for that band. So that's, that's something I'm, I'm currently, I very kind of much smashing myself into <laughs> very much look forward to that that's awesome yeah man i'm i'm excited too so that's that'll be recorded you know before the year's out i uh i should have that music cool like my part of it done in the next couple of weeks and um so keep your ear to the ground because it'll it'll be interesting it'll be different for for me so. sweet that's very cool yeah rick what about you do you have any other uh cool projects or are you just pouring your soul into the red opera right now no after the red opera is done uh because i mean the book's already written so Mm -hmm. now we're just doing that hyper stress of kickstarter of like okay we need everybody's help that we can because we have this 30-day window to go yep but uh you know obviously i'll have some stretch goal content to write afterwards but my sequel uh as a publisher now and so it's written and i got like 79 pages of dev editing left and it's like hey magic returns uh companies brand it you know just sign here on the paperwork and and you get you know special powers just take this product have at it um but i so i have to finish that and then uh xyz game labs and i are going to work on a project uh called hindsight which is where i'm going to be it's like a, like a, a really awesome escape room uh where like a puzzle game where you're doing this stuff mm-hmm. and the tagline for it is hey i have two bits of news we two uh, two or sorry two bits of news one is that the world is going to end in 18 minutes. Good news is we just finished our prototype time, time, time machine. And so I have to craft a thousand ways the world can end uh, so that people can have this like narrative experience while they're, while they're doing it. The game is freaking awesome. And I was cool. really excited to do uh, the narrative design for it. But then I have um, the Storytellers Forge, which is mm-hmm. teaching kids and people how to become storytellers yep. through play. And then I have to write a third book and uh, I, my nighttime, and then I'm, I'm blogging, I'm writing for Geek and Sundry still, or Nerdist, I'm trying to submit pictures for that. And at some point, I really want to play Baldur's Gate 3 when it comes out. Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'm going to find a way. I feel like this is a, a call of three people who don't know how to not be busy. <laughs> 
my management yeah. skills. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to all of those things. Seriously. Um, sorry, my brain is also still stuck on you doing a Dillinger Escape Plan esque project. Sorry. <laughs> Um, that said, uh, lightning round questions. This will be fun. Uh, I have a feeling I already know what your answer to this question is going to be, James. But uh, for both of you, who is your favorite character in the Red Opera? James, you first. Mine. <laughs> it's mine. You know, like I think I sort of share like you know, as I'm really, cause I'm a fairly recent addition to all this. Mm -hmm. So like, as I'm like at this point now where I'm, I've kind of recently can identify as someone who is familiar with, <laughs> with, with everything here. Yep. Um, I sort of share kind of an equal love for all the characters in this story, but I am very personally invested in, in Dorian and, yeah. You know, have, having it resonate with me so so much, I think, has that, has that effect. So I guess I would have to say mine, which might be a bit of a cop out answer. I don't know, but no, it's it's perfectly legitimate. I I have usually yeah. identify with my characters the best as well. <laughs> yeah, I love Lacroix too, but I also, whenever I think of Lacroix, I think of uh, I think of Drake Mafesta. He's a, <laughs> he's a gold he's a golden hearted guy, and it's hard for me to separate those two as well. Nice. <laughs> Rick, what about you? Uh, there's a side character called Alios. He's a uh, he's a quote unquote cleric uh, who hangs around in Patron's Pass, which is like this bridge that goes yep. between the Shade Lands. And the the truth is, is for people who are actually listening to this interview, I worked in a divine assassin into the book, whose job is strictly there trying to find ways to murder warlocks before they become too lost as an assassin he's a shape changer who like wears his mask and he runs the whole assassin's guild he's like this independent entity that actually has like his fingers in all three bridges but he's you know he comes off as a as a cleric but he's really a hardcore dirty divine assassin who will murder patrons if he can find a way to do it that's and awesome. it you know obviously the big four characters the ones that you see on stage are are there but my favorite as a writer that is just in there is like somebody that's like this glue of what's a cleric going to think of this? Yeah. The clerics are in the shade lands. They're just stabbing you in the dark. <laughs> is that the blue mask? No, that's Majin character. Got Ma it. Ma Ma Majin's the, uh, that may, he's, he's my second favorite. He's, he is yeah, my character in the shade lands that I wrote that Colin plays on stage. Nice. So mm -hmm. Majin's probably mine from what I've read so far. So that's cool. Nice. Um, uh, all respect to Diamorte and Drake and obviously Blackground Initiate, but who are your favorite bands that aren't any of those? <laughs> I am huge into nerd metal and things like that. So it's all Ilo Vete or the Megas. I happen to have a huge fan. I have tattoos of Mega Man and Castlevania uh, stuff on me. I like the, the Proto Man. Uh, you know, so I like a lot of that that stuff um, from the old school days that, you know, I grew up on KMFDM, Nine Inch Nails, Lords of Acid, that kind of stuff. Uh, Same. But, you know, uh, but you know, currently these days, if it's not metal and it's not there, I am definitely into uh, nerd nerd rock. Nice. Well, nice. Bar Bardcore is a new one that I just learned. Bardcore is and amazing. I, I love Bardcore. I, I just discovered Bardcore about I don't know, like nine months ago or something. Yeah. And someone sent me a video, uh, a, a song off YouTube a, a couple weeks ago, and I was just like, "What is it? Oh, this is amazing! I need more of this." <laughs> So which 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 bands are bardcore? The bardcore is uh, mostly so far covers of modern songs played on medieval instruments, and usually with the lyrics oh, written to be okay. in like old English. Yeah. Okay, I've seen this then. <laughs> it's it's, it's good. good stuff. Uh, what about you, James? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, favorite bands. I um. One of my favorite bands right now is a band that. I actually grew up with um, called Rivers of Nihil. Nice. Uh, Rivers of Nihil is a band. We are kind of from the same town, mm -hmm. or at least Black Crown is from the same town as, as them, and they grew up as kids. I lived like an hour and a half away. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've known them since I was real young, you know. Awesome. Um, they're uh, they, watching them grow 
as musicians in the last album that they put out is one of the most unique things you'll ever hear oh, yeah. in, in heavy metal. Um, there's saxophone all over the record. Um, it's, it's very beautifully done. It's very tastefully done. Um, so them, uh, I really love, cool. I, I'm kind of like a, a guy who likes to, as far as metal goes, I like kind of avant-garde stuff. I really like Isan. Yep. I like Ulver. I like, yep. uh, I like dissonant stuff like, mm-hmm. uh, Death Spell Omega yep. and, uh, Ulcerate and stuff like that. It makes you sound like you're going to hell. They the real, real scary stuff. Um, and outside of metal, I think my favorite like performer act is probably uh, Wardruna. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. They uh, they've like they did a lot of the music for that show Vikings, Vikings and I yep. guess they're going to be in that uh, the upcoming uh, Assassin's Creed. Yep. So that their music is always kind of funny. I just I just started watching Vikings. Yeah. Good yeah. Show. Yep. They do a lot of the music in, in that show. He like co-writes it. Yep. Uh, so that music for me is very like it's it's meditative. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of helps me achieve a certain mind state. Yep. If that makes sense. Yeah, I actually uh, similar. Actually, um, I have a background in Norse mythology and uh, neo- Norse neo paganism, uh, and that's them as well as Ovete are like high up on the list for me in terms of music I connect to on like meditative and really clearing my mind sense. That's really cool. Same, same. Awesome. Um, for both of you, uh, from the, from the Kickstarter, which is currently active for the red opera, what is your favorite stretch goal or add on that you're most excited about? Okay. I think I know, I know yours. Right. James, so <laughs> J- James can't answer the stretch goal one. I can. So <laughs> I will let him answer the add-ons because he can at least talk about, you know, what are the add-ons that we have uh, mm-hmm. potentially. Uh, but my favorite stretch goal is, it's not announced yet, uh, but it is a chapter on food and festivals so. in the Shadelands where we're going to expand it and actually include drinks and recipes that players will be able to uh actually make because food is really immersive for me and i will often cook before games in in thematic ways but we're also going to talk about like how a culture that has actual magic uh might use food for high end cooking and as offerings to patrons and gods so very cool now james if you don't know any of the add-ons i can i could grab this one but i think you got at least one of them that you the add-ons I, I, yeah, I, I like, can't remember like which is which anymore, to be honest. I'm kind of like, because <laughs> I feel like it, it all kind of came at me at once and I'm, I'm still like. Like the coffee. Uh, the coffee well, is my yeah, favorite add on. Uh, yeah, you know, or like the, the coins of Yon Koth are, are pretty cool too. Um, I can't wait to get all the stuff, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like the, the book. I really want the. Getting your hands book. on the physical products is going to be really yeah. cool. Yeah. It'll be. But exciting. I. I yeah, I mean the coffee thing too, because it's also sort of like a it's like a Dorian thing. Mm-hmm. It's like a Dorian coffee. I wanted to make sure that I could play that Death Clock uh, coffee <laughs> jingle music video <laughs> yeah. in a project that I worked on just once in my life, and so we had Initiative Coffee actually work with a Milwaukee roaster to make us a metal coffee. That's so, mm-hmm. yep, and uh, nailed it. By the way, I did get to try some of the coffee at Drake's house. Oh, sweet. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. Very yeah. cool. I'm, I'm kind of a I'm kind of like a coffee. Uh, like I used to be a barista for like for a couple of years, and I, I really nerded in on like honed in on on coffee quite a bit. And it is like oh 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 man, it aged beautifully. I gotta say. See, I I knew you knew what to add on because I knew Drake was giving you a sample of the coffee, and I was like, yep. Yeah, you do. You I, did know the, the coffee may actually also be what I'm most excited. For because i am a huge coffee snob as well uh and i was like metal D D coffee yes please give it to me mm-hmm. it's just like so much there's so much good stuff there man i can't yeah it's it's gonna be it's <laughs> gonna be cool there's a lot of cool cool stuff in it um mm-hmm. i threw some money down for sure same same selfishly <laughs> I, I could have donated because i just believed in the project because it does give you that option mm-hmm. and it's not that i don't however <laughs> I need some coffee. All right. Yeah, I need I mean, what do you, what bags you of coffee, me? right? Like, I, like, I like my drugs. I like my drugs. So it is what it is. 
Awesome. Uh, last question. Rick, dream project. If there's anything you could work on. Wraith. Yep. Okay. That's easy. Yeah. That, that's uh, actually. I, on J- Jason too. Carl. J- Jason Carl laughed at me and he was like, oh, you poor unfortunate soul. When I said <laughs> that I would love to work on Wraith if they ever revived the game line or Orpheus in, in some capacity. Oh. Uh, so if it is ever noted anywhere that anybody's working on a freaking Wraith project, please find me on the <laughs> internet. I will like throw things at you until I'm allowed to like work on right on that project. Well, um, and then how excited for the uh, VR game are you? Uh, extremely. I'm going to buy a VR headset and system just for that. Nice. Yeah. I'm uh VR gives me headaches. So I'm, I'm, I want to try it, but I'm like, I might have to like, just make someone else play through it up for our Twitch channel and just sit there and watch it. <laughs> what about you, James? Man, so like I said earlier, I have been kind of entertaining the idea of getting into more like on camera mm-hmm. acting e stuff. And uh, I saw that they're doing casting for the Amazon Prime Lord of the Rings show that's coming up. They don't have open casting for The Witcher yet. Mm-hmm. But that's also a thing that yep. could be as well as the uh, Game of Thrones spinoff series. Oh, yeah. the, um, yep. If I could do something in that realm, I would be pretty pretty stoked. I almost had an opportunity to be on Game of Thrones. Yeah. That got that got horribly, horribly botched. Oh, no. When I, was on, when I was on tour in Europe in 2016, mm-hmm. I, um, I was meeting up with a Scotsman who I had previously been on tour with with a heavy metal band called dying fetus. Yep. Um, there, they had a stage manager who was a Scottish fella and he was just like, Oh man, you know, he, he just kept telling me every day. He's like, you really got to be on one of those shows, you know, one of those shows where you have a beard and hair. <laughs> he's just like, Oh, you're just too perfect. Like it just seemed like he had this, like he had this dire look in his eye. Like, this is just something you have to do. And if it doesn't happen, I'm just going to be sad. So like he, knew some a couple of fellows who were extras on game of thrones okay it has some level of connection with the casting of the show mm-hmm. so we had a glasgow date that we were playing and a scheduled time of arrival so i was gonna get to glasgow meet up with these guys and we were all gonna go hang out for the day and kind of get acquainted we were gonna go to the castle where monty python was filmed yep um and then get a I don't know, get a bunch of beers, whatever you do in Scotland. And uh go to castles, drink beer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, drink some Scottish ales, there were plenty to be had. There are. And I did in the end. But so what happened was is our bus driver decided he needed some extra sleep. So we arrived to Glasgow about seven hours late. Ow. Which, you know, I'm glad the bus driver took whatever sleep he needed, right? Because I don't want to die. Yeah. When you're out on the road, that's like the way you're going to die, right? Like, yep. just the likelihood increases every time you go out. So, you know, I'm glad he, he took that measure. But at the same time, I'm just like, ah, ah you know, that yep. might have been might have been cool. So we'll see if I could, if I could have a project, it would be that. Very cool. Dream thing. Very cool. Well, hopefully. You, you you do have the uh, the right look for it, so. <laughs> Thank you. Or Anne Rice is like she's doing some kind of vampire. Yeah, the the, show the rights for the Vampire Chronicles with, were picked up. Yep. I, I so I, I would also do that. I would also do that. Very cool. Hundred <laughs> percent. Very cool. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Um, we are at Kahana Gaming are very very excited about the Red Opera. It was a pleasure to get to play it, and we're really looking forward to um, doing more with it. Rick, where can people find you online? So I am online almost everywhere at Cranky Bolt, uh, whether it be you know League of Legends, Twitter, whatever the case. Uh, mm-hmm. You can find me at Geek and Sundry, um, and Gilding Light is where I do most of my blog posts and writing, along with Apotheos Studios. Mm-hmm. But largely, you can just type in Rick Hines or Cranky Bolt, and uh, you know you'll find me on Twitter that way. Uh, I mostly use Facebook and Twitter. So awesome. And James, where can people find you online? 
Well, I am mostly on Instagram. Mm -hmm. That's like my big thing. You can find me at, uh, my screen name is Odorod, which is O-D-R dot O-D-D. You can also follow Black Crown Initiate uh, or Replus Sire on Instagram as well. Um, And my screen names are the same for for Twitter. Awesome. And uh, yeah, pretty pretty fine. You can also check out my website at jamesdorton.com if you want to hear my, my voice stuff awesome as i said gentlemen thank you very much i appreciate it i hope you are doing well and look forward to seeing more from both of you very very soon yeah likewise man wait till i get to run you guys through uh, some more games together oh, yeah. and uh continue the story that we put on last time and this time you know james you got a cop in i was gonna say maybe we'll get a guest appearance from uh the accursed king yep let me know because i would love to absolutely love to. that would be great Ooh, hold on a minute <laughs> a lot of plotting going on i could i could work with that i could work with that yes all right well uh but thank you very much for having us absolutely yeah man thanks for your time as well we appreciate it